by Danny during my undergrad years. Uh, and I've recently got to know Trish as well through some shared interest in uh, sport and research. Trish specializes in um, sport and exercise psychology and Danny in um, sport and exercise physiology. So together, perfect combination to, to discuss that connection between body and mind in running. Um, as I'm sure you all do, I often wonder what it is that gives up first uh, and what it is that keeps me going. Is it my mind? Is it my body? Um, the topic actually was evident as well in the last chat we had with the Bob Graham runners. Um, so it makes sense to, to bring out the science behind it all. So here we are. Let's welcome Trish uh, Jackman and Danny Taylor. Nice to see you both. Hi. Uh... Hi, Anna. You all right? Good. Thank you. So I think it probably makes sense to start with uh, having you to just say a little bit about yourselves, if that's all right. So um, if we go with Trish first, do you want to uh, just say a little bit about your research and your background? Yeah, so um, I'm a, a lecturer in sport and exercise psychology at the University of Lincoln. So I, my research is focused on essentially the psychology of excellent performance, what we think, how we feel and how we behave when we are essentially at our best. So I'm really interested in topics such as flow, performing well under pressure. And in addition to that, do some work around mental health and well-being as well, not only in sport, but beyond that. But my primary research area would be around the psychology of excellent performance. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And Danny, if you would like to say a bit about your background as well. Yeah, well, I'm a bit of a hybrid. Um, I'm a physiologist by trade. So at the uni, my, my role is primarily lecturer in physiology and sport physiology. So interesting how, uh, how the body side of things works and how we can optimise that. Um, but my PhD and research to date has been uh, focused on pacing and, and the demands of multi-sport competition like triathlon, including running. Uh, so including that is an element of perception, um, deception uh, and psychological sort of elements that allow us to maximise our potential, I suppose, in, in events. Brilliant, really good overlap of your research there then, so I think it'll uh, give us some interesting uh, discussion during this evening. Um, so shall we go to Shane, are you going to kick off the questions for yeah. us? Yeah, so I'll kick off with the first question. Um, before I do, if anyone watching, if you get any questions at any point, as always, pop them in the comments and uh, we'll do our best to ask them as and when we can and uh, get people to answer them. Um, so yeah, first question really, uh, obviously it's really aimed at you to start with Trish as it's, you know, one of, your, one of your areas of research, but you know, what is flow and um, how can it help us? Yeah, so I guess the, the topic of flow, if, if we think about running, I suppose a lot of people have possibly heard of the runner's high. Think about golf, people have, you know, a lot of times people refer to someone being in the zone. Um, I suppose from a psychology perspective, if we think about what people think about and how they feel, that the main framework we have to understand what we call optimal experiences is this topic of flow. And essentially flow is this intrinsic rewarding psychological state, which means that it is an experience that we have that we, we're enjoying it and the rewards are internal to us. So it makes us you know, feel happy, it's a very pleasant experience. And it's not necessarily one that is pleasant because we are succeeding or we're winning. So it's not as though there's this extrinsic reward there. So when we're in flow, it's what we call an intrinsically rewarding psychological state. We tend to be totally absorbed in what we're doing. Um, we have a sense of almost being, you know, immersed in the activity and anything outside of that seems to, to move away into the background. We're totally focused on what we're doing. And, Typically, we often talk about this idea that it can be hard to focus or to concentrate, but when we're in this type of experience, what often happens is that we tend to be able to focus and it doesn't seem to take the same kind of mental effort that it typically would take. And in addition to that, what's also absent is this concern for maybe some negative thoughts that we often have. So, you know, if we're out running, it could be the case that we have that, that negative voice in our head or maybe we're concerned for what other people are thinking but whereas when we're in flow what tends to be the case is that we kind of lose a little bit of, of that concern for the opinion of others 
I think one of the other hallmarks of this is the fact that we, we have a sense of control over what we're doing, and yet this still happens even in challenging situations. So overall, it's, it's a really positive experience. And you know, people look back on experiences like this often for, for months and years to come, and they can really recall when they've had some powerful experiences. But that said, you know, a lot of people will say that they have experiences like this quite frequently where they just got lost, they're out in a run, they get lost in what they're doing, they lose a kind of a sense of, of time and so on. So my research is really focused on understanding how can we help people to have these experiences more frequently? And then also what guidance can we give to people when they're in an experience like that on how to make it last a little bit longer? Because we know that there are a whole host of benefits from having experiences like this. It, you know, it increases your confidence, you're, you're more motivated because you want to get back, you want to have an experience like that again. Um, in addition, it has some psychological benefits. So not only are you getting the benefits of exercise and how that can improve our, our mental health and so on but it's it's really good for our self-esteem and also for our psychological well-being so this was my my passion is really for understanding experiences like this and how we can help people to have them more frequently consistently and for longer periods of time okay um is there any research into say like how, how flow might cross over into the to the physiology of something is it is it purely a perception thing or you know, has any research been done to to look at, you know, if, is, is your heart rate level or your blood lactate levels different or anything like that? So hopefully, um, Danny, we might need to, uh, we've been having a lot of conversations, myself and Danny, about, about taking this forward. But I suppose at present, we have, we've even got challenges around the perceptual measurement of, of an experience like this, first off. So if we look at, at sport and exercise, I suppose one of the challenges, number one, is we first of all need to have a really good theory to be able to explain how these states occur. And that's at the minute where we're still a little bit away from that. Um, so that makes it a bit more challenging for us to go into a lab and to try and conduct experiments and so on. But hopefully in the next few years, we'll be in a position to do that. Obviously, one of the challenges of trying to induce an experience like this in a lab is that you know we still need to, to learn more about how these experiences happen for us to be able to do that uh, and often I suppose it's considered to be quite a rare and elusive experience so, so there are some challenges with that but if if we look beyond the sport and exercise domain there's been some really nice work in other areas kind of music um, computer game playing and they've found some links around the physiology um, and so on. So kind of activities that have less um, inherent physical activity in them, they have begun to do a little bit of work in that area. But it's something that, you know, we'd like to look at a lot more within within the context of sport and exercise moving forward. And uh, what we do know is that a, a, an experience like flow tends to be one in which there's a reduced perception of effort. So your RP does tend to be lower. So from a perceptual perspective, or looking at the psychophysiology, it is a state that tends to be experienced as um, you're still objectively your effort could still be quite high, but your perception of that tends to be lower. Mm, good. Um, I think, um, Anna, if we go over to, to your next question, I think that will that'll tie in nicely now. Yeah, actually. And, and you did, you mentioned looking at research with uh, music in a, in a lab sort of setting, but, can we use things like music or podcasts or whatever how to, to sort of influence that flow? Can, can we have sort of, I guess what I'm saying is, can we use sort of external factors um, to help us experience flow? So if we know we've, this is how, how it makes us feel, feels good. Um, yeah. How does that work? Is there research on that? Yeah, so I suppose it probably ties in quite nicely to the study I'm doing at the minute. Um, which is around looking at strategies people use to prolong states like flow, but also kind of more performance under pressure states. So those, I suppose, not that they're less pleasurable, but often they're a bit more intense. So if we're doing a really hard workout, maybe it's kind of on an RP scale, an eight or nine out of 10, how do we keep going? How do we push through? Um, so at the minute, that's kind of one of the, the projects that I'm doing is looking at strategies people use. But I suppose if we draw on some of our previous work around this area, what we've 
tend to find, and, and there's still, you know, tentative evidence we're, we're hoping to gather more is, is what we tend to do that helps a, a state like flow is to actually be somewhat distracted from the task that we're doing. So music is quite a good example of that. Um, if we look at it from a point of view of attentional focus, we often talk about five different areas. So I'm just kind of drawing on some of Noel Brick's work. And for those of you who are interested in the area of, of endurance performance, I'd, I'd highly recommend taking a look at some of his work. And he talks about, you know, if we look at the literature and the thoughts that come into our minds during a run, um, so it could be internal sensory monitoring is the first one. So we're thinking about fatigue, how, how fatigued our legs may be. For example, we're thinking about our breathing. We think about external monitoring. So we're looking outside, we're kind of surveying the scene, we're, we're taking into account, you know, where are the mile markers, um, you know, if we're in a race, where's the water station, those types of things. Um, but also we, we use what's called active self-regulation. And, and these are strategies where we're actually, actually trying to, to control our thoughts, to manage them. So we might use a pacing strategy or, you know, some people might use a thunking strategy where you break, you know, if you're going for a mile, you might break it down into uh, 0.25 of a mile or so on. Or we set different goals or we use self-talk. So they're kind of self-regulatory strategies. But then there's also another branch, and that's referred to as more distractive thoughts. And what we've tended to find is that when people are, tend to report flow, they say what actually helps them is to think about things that aren't necessarily related to, you know, putting a golf ball or kicking a rugby ball or just running, the actual act of running. Think about thinking about putting one foot in front of the other. If we can think about things that, don't allow us to engage in those cognitions that can actually be quite helpful so what we tend to find is things like music are quite good for that and uh, we know that music is, is something that actually improves how we feel our effective response so there's um, a huge meta-analysis was published earlier this year and we found you know that that research has indicated that if we look at sport and exercise psychology research music is really helpful for improving our our effect which is essentially our feelings of pleasure and displeasure so if if we can find some music you know that works for us um there you know there are a lot of individual differences in relation to that but that can make our experiences more pleasant um, likewise what we tend to find is things like the scenery just actually being very mindful of being outdoors <coughs> at the minute so obviously at present i'm sure a lot of us are doing you know outdoor runs and, and so on and so forth but actually being quite mindful of, of your scenery and noticing that can be really helpful to take your mind away from maybe some of the bodily sensations that can often be triggers i guess for disrupting experiences like this so i guess it's finding things that can add pleasure to to your activities whatever that might be and trying to reduce i suppose the the amount of mental activity that that often tends to be going on when you know we hit maybe some of those more intense periods in our workout yeah um, individual because i know that uh, music for example is something that often divides runners their, their opinion on whether to run with or without music and some people just cannot go without it and some people say well actually that it distracts them from exactly what you were just saying in terms of countryside and enjoying the scenery or whatever so i guess it's finding what works for specific individuals um yeah okay shall we did you want to i was just gonna just gonna jump in on that bit like from from that point in terms of like sort of that the when you want your high performance in a race obviously does that conflict with you know being focused on the task at hand um or is it a good way to you know is, is it subjective if someone who's sort of um normally an overthinker and gets distracted on race day by thinking too much about it is, are these distraction techniques good good for that person to stop distracting them from the task at hand? If, if, does that make sense? I think I just confused myself. Yeah, um, yeah how, how essentially how that's like that, all of that works really well in training. You know, you can you can look at scenery, use music, but when these things aren't there on race day, you know, some some races, some events simply just aren't fun to look at your scenery. Um, you know, you're running around industrial estates or boring courses because it's a fast mm -hmm. course for those people chasing pb so how how does that relate over to race day Is yeah it, so it, i think that's a really good point because if we actually look at 
I suppose some of, some of the research around something like flow is that at present, we still need to learn a lot more about objectively how something like that impacts on our performance. So if we actually look at some of those distractive strategies, whilst they might make our experience more pleasurable and so on, generally speaking, from a pacing perspective, they might necessarily almost always be most optimal. So what we would tend to find is that in terms of objective performance, it's, it's more those active self-regulatory strategies that are really useful. So that could be, you know, focusing on your technique, your cadence, what strategy you're going to use in a race, kind of the, the goal setting, chunking strategies, maybe you might use some mantras. Those sorts of things are really good from the perspective of, of optimizing your pace. Um, and that also helps us to, to move more economically as well. So I think at, at present, I suppose some of those strategies, I think that they're types of things that you might use more infrequently, whereas you know a lot of runners will be wanting to stay at a particular pace. Um, so they will probably be paying a lot more attention to you know monitoring their watch, monitoring their pace, making pacing decisions off the back of that as well. So I think from that perspective, it's it's not that you, what we tend to advise is that we can't really rely, I guess, on, on a couple of strategies. The, the, the ultimate goal for runners is almost to have a, a toolkit of, of different strategies that you can draw on at different times. And some strategies will be more appropriate to, you know, make your experience more pleasurable, whereas others, it could be the case, you know, if you're doing an interval session and you need to really push it on for a couple of hundred meters, whatever it may be, that's not, probably not a time to, to get too distracted. You want to really focus on you know, using a, a self-talk strategy to keep you going for that period of time. So it's almost like having a, a, a range of different strategies that you can just be able to get into a position where you know at certain times when to deploy certain strategies and when is most appropriate to do so. Okay. So you can, you can use your strategies to make it a deliberate decision and encourage flow. Um, encourage flow, encourage other experiences, I would say as well. So what we've looked at is around another area called clutch performance, which is um, an experience we have when we perform well under pressure. So often what we've tended to find, particularly with runners and other athletes, is that this experience tends to happen towards the end of an event. So it's a bit more of an, it's an intense day that's more effortful. Objectively, it's good for performance. And what we tend to find is that in this experience, um, when you are kind of increasing your performance in a, in a demanding situation, is that people then tend to use strategies such as their self-talk or maybe they're monitoring their pace a little bit more so they, they might be managing how quickly they're running or the extent to which they're stepping up their pace in the closing stages. So from that perspective, what we're tending to find is that depending on the optimal experience you're in, whether it be flow or something more like a clutch performance day, that the types of strategy you use um, could actually be quite important in terms of maximizing those experiences. But um, as I said, that the more um, at the minute, that's something that we're, we're trying to look into is what types of strategies are people using when they're in these states and this was why they're, they're helping them to prolong them for longer as well. I suppose just to come in more, more generally, Shane, on your point, <clears throat> I think there's evidence that higher level runners will naturally uh, be more comfortable thinking about their internal sensations, so how hard the breathing is, you know, muscular pain, whatever, whatever it might be. Like, you, like you've alluded to, you know, it's hard to run. Because I think the general evidence suggests that novice runners or people getting into it are more likely to try and distract themselves from that. So I suppose a general message might be for those wanting to progress in their running to start to find a way to become familiar with those sensations and the ones that work for them as well. So whether that's their cadence or their breathing or you know whatever that might be to start to think about the the specific triggers they they find are effective for them internally uh, rather than always trying to block them out and you know as they try and get better and better because uh, it's natural to them want to you know, ignore them and that doesn't help performance at the end of the day so okay interesting um right uh what are we on to next 
Um, so I think, yeah, on, in terms of um, in, in, term, in terms of flow, uh, and, and I guess well, the, these optimal these experiences. Um, I guess if, if we move on to the sort of the, the sub sub maximal easy stuff, I know is that I think about I think the other before we sort of go on to more okay. physiology. Yeah, that makes sense and it flows on quite nicely, doesn't it? So um, yeah, so what we were what Shane and I were sort of talking over yesterday um, as runners, and I'm not even sure who's going to be best placed to answer this question. Probably be a bit both. So as runners, we're quite aware that. We need to do. We need to train long and, and slow long runs at slower paces. Um, and most of us do that. We think in our training programs. However, I would say from from my experience, um, most of us don't do it quite slowly enough. Um, so, what I wanted to sort of ask you are first of all, what are the physiological benefits of doing those kind of sessions? Um, and how can we get our head in the game really to perform those sessions at the right pace? Uh, is it down to things like self-talk or external factors um, or, or are there any sort of strategies that we can sort of tap into perhaps so that we can slow ourselves down to get those physiological gains? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, we kind of feel like we've achieved something, don't we? And, and I think when we run really slow, we don't feel like we are doing so i guess that's what i'm getting at well i mean not physiologically but in the in the training literature anyway there's quite a lot of um popular literature emerging at the moment about this idea of dividing your training up like you've said you know in, in terms of polarizing it so making your easy stuff easy and making your hard stuff hard and try not to fall into that sort of middle ground where you're always doing everything as hard as you can given the time that you've got um so i think that's that's a pretty well established idea like you said it's how people adhere to that um, and certainly one thing that may help is is objective tools in the sense of you know it's getting easier and easier to get heart rate monitors and, and gps type devices um and und i suppose i suppose one element of it is understanding the bang for the book that you're going to get by being strict with that um, and rather than feeling that going hard or pushing yourself every session is the way to go um, i don't think there's an easy way to address that other than people reflecting on what they're doing and, and wanting to listen to maybe advice or some of the evidence out there but there is certainly evidence that longer slower sessions not only promote specific adaptations physically uh, within the muscles and the cardiovascular system but they also allow recovery for harder sessions where you're going to gain different benefits you know within the same systems and the danger is that people like you said drift into the middle and then are neither here nor there in terms of the adaptations they're getting and also in terms of their long-term burnout or, or long-term freshness to be able to get the most from their session um, so I think there is, there, is, there is an element also of um, people using those sessions to build up their, and this is now leading into Trish having a say on this, um, building up their mental picture of the intensity spectrum as well. Um, mm. If you're always going as hard as you can in a certain session and, and merging in that middle ground, then I think people may be missing out on those sensations at the, you know, in, in those hard sessions and really appreciating their, their levels there and also the longer sessions allow you to build up your distance as well. So if people are unfamiliar with that and start to always feel like they've got to push themselves really hard, then really they're, they're going to limit themselves in terms of the progression they make with their distance familiarization, which is really important for pacing. So yeah. um, I'll let Trish come in at this point because I can gas. So. <laughs> That's really interesting. And, and yeah, and actually Trish, another point really uh, just to follow on is um, can you, are you more likely to achieve flow? in one of those easier sessions, those longer, slower paced sessions, or is it more likely to, to come when you are pushing yourself harder? Yeah, so I suppose it can be different for, for different people. Um, so as to, to, to go to Danny's point there, I think that that notion of rationalizing what you're doing is, is really important in terms of the intensity and recognizing that, you know, the body obviously, in terms of from a point of view of adapting, um, you know, you have to be able to manage those intensities. I think from a from a flow perspective, 
you know, those sessions where you're going out, you don't necessarily have a, a spe specific time in mind. You, you're going out there with a little bit less pressure. You know, you, you vaguely want to run maybe a certain amount of miles or cover a certain distance, but you might just do it that you want to run it at a pretty comfortable pace or you do, just don't have those specific goals or those expectations. And that can be quite useful for actually helping you to get into into a, an experience like flow. Um, but I suppose sometimes you do want to do those more intense workouts. So from that perspective, I suppose it's been able to, to manage that as well. But I think from the point of view of, you know, Danny spoke about that, that spectrum of intensities and what that can be really useful as well is, is developing what we call metacognitive knowledge. So metacognition is how we think about our thoughts. So at the minute, um, you know, if I'm running, for example, um, and I get, you know, some fatigue in my legs, that, that makes me feel that this is difficult. So that's kind of a higher level of thinking. So if we're fully engaging all of those, the, those different spectrums, it could be the case that, um, you know, we're, we then start to get better at picking out what a feeling of discomfort is from a feeling of pain. If, if you know, if we're, if we're looking at the spectrum or, or some days we feel really good, what does feeling good actually look like? Or, or maybe we get more accustomed to, to what a certain pace is like and we get more accustomed to the bodily sensations that come along with that. But if we haven't, I suppose, utilized that full spectrum of intensities and that ability to kind of learn about our body, learn about listening to body, what is our bodies, what it's actually saying to us, how we <coughs> interpret that information and so on. So I think that can actually also be a really powerful tool for developing knowledge about ourselves as a runner as well. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. It's a good point. I think that, that flows nicely on to um, sort of the next question. Uh, I was going to ask, we have had a question from Rob as well on the comments, but I think it might be a good one to come in later that, Rob. So we'll, we'll ask that a bit later. Um, so essentially, yeah, um, you know, does our physiology cre uh, dictate the pace we train at or race at, or do our brains dictate what physiological outputs we can maintain? Um, I guess that's that's sort of I guess the central governor or not um so you know that can open a massive kind of worms but generally like what's your two sort of perspective on that and and you know and how does it link with things like like pacing and and then sort of optimal psychological experiences and in training yeah well well there's a lot of there's the central governor theory has then spent since then it's probably been, you could count about eight to ten different theories that are equivalent to that um, so it's a bit of a minefield and I've heard it described as trying to um, pin jelly to a wall you know in terms of understanding it properly but the bottom line is we've got a physiological performance potential at any given point in time you know just because I think I want to run a marathon as fast as Mo Farah I'm not obviously clearly not going to so we, we've got an upper limit for our capability and, and our potential at a given point in time and also you know more generally over the course of maybe a training season but that potential is not going to be fulfilled without our brains essentially you know, dictating what it is we do with that and, and how we approach that. So there's certainly um, a myriad of factors, both central and physiological. Um, and I don't think we're necessarily any close to understanding how they interact specifically, but there's no doubt that you can't have one without the other and vice versa. Um, so they're both extremely important. Um, but yeah, I think the main thing when, when people are starting to maybe try and understand their running performance is um, there is going to be a, a, a performance capability limit that they'll have at that point in time and to try and understand that in an honest way. And like Trish quite rightly said, understand that conversation between them and their body and see it like that. Um, I'll leave it there and let Trish come in with, with what she thinks at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I would absolutely fully agree. And I think you know, an important thing is, is actually harnessing the psychology to, to make the most of the physiology. So even just going back to Anna's point around kind of how we, we need to have our, our easy runs need to be easy and our hard, so our hard runs can be hard. That in and of itself, you know, rationalizing that, there's a huge amount of psychology that actually goes, goes into that and actually accepting that. You know, I, I need to run at, at a certain time in my long run so that I can I can hit a, a really good kind of sharper session and so on. So 
I think, yeah, you know, there will be physiological limits for everybody, but the extent to which we can reach those limits, um, you know, there is a, an intertwining and interlinkage there between the psychology and the physiology. So use, utilizing our, our psychology to, to optimize the, the physiology and the physiological um, characteristics or whatever it may be that we have, um, I think ultimately it's a combination too. And, and you know, other, other areas as well, you know, we can think about from a biomechanics perspective as well, how that integrates, how we move. Um, so I think, you know, there's a whole core of, of disciplines here from, from the sports sciences that, you know, when we can, I suppose, get the, the nice blend between all of them, that's when we can, we can strive and achieve that, that optimal performance. Um, so does this, uh, is this where sort of some of your research on uh, perception and deception comes into to play? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the studies that we've done is reasonably consistent in running anyway, that um, you typically can tolerate, you know, if, if, we, if we get a runner to, to self-pace an event, let's say a 5k, 10k, um, then there'll be some wiggle room in terms of uh, protective reserve that someone will hold back of about three to five percent, something like that. Um, depending largely as well on you know there's individual differences in that but um potentially experience levels as well and the level of the athlete but there's certainly the idea that as um, human beings we our brains want to protect us from damage and in doing so even if we think we're pushing really hard there will still be an element of reserve there to dig into um the question is when and how to use that and and how much we can access that without it becoming dangerous obviously um but yeah there's certainly um an element of belief in there that a lot of my studies have, have tapped into in terms of how we can um, approach an event to our maximum potential um, with the information that we've got and, and deception is one way that you can do that and um, practically obviously it's then difficult to, to put that into practice um, but there's a suggestion that coaches may use it for example maybe even in training in hard interval sessions um, when the, the consequences of maybe playing around with someone's pacing like that are, are a bit less severe than, than competition um, but yeah some interesting work still going on in that field mm. so, so just sticking with that then Danny um, and sort of thinking about pacing strategies and pacing strategies in competition um, can they can a pacing strategy I guess hold, a, hold the athlete back sometimes or do you think it's always a benefit to have one how essential is it I think it's important for people to think about their pacing. Um, I think there's no getting away from that. The, the thing with pacing is you can have a pacing strategy for a whole event, but obviously the longer the event gets, then the more difficult it is to predict what's going to happen during the event internally and externally as well. So I think it's important to have a broad strategy in mind, but to think of pacing as a series of ongoing decisions. So to be in a position where you're, more and more confident as you get more and more experienced with making decisions about how hard you're running in this case at a given point in time, given the information you've got. So I don't think it's necessarily the be all and end all to have an overarching strategy, but certainly um, an idea of the important information that you might consider about an event, you know, whether that's the terrain, the weather, um, competition, you know, it may be that you're running a time trial one way, it may be that you're running a competition in a pack because you're on the track another. Um, your experience levels, you know, have you run that distance before? So there's a, there's a whole host of factors that might come into play where you've got to make, be in a position to make decisions um, as you go. Uh, and obviously that comes with experience. So I think for the novice athlete, then a pacing strategy that is obviously cautious is, is the way to go and that would be a positive you know what's called a positive pacing strategy so where you set yourself markers as you go and maybe start slightly more cautiously based on your training paces and then work from there upwards yeah. without trying to achieve an optimum pacing strategy which just for the record doesn't really exist at the moment there isn't an optimum pacing strategy um, whereas more more experienced athletes over so certainly from 5k onwards up in distance really want to be aiming for an even pacing strategy um, over the course of an event um, based on sort of current modeling but yeah the consensus is because of all those different factors that come into play on any given day 
that that isn't an optimum pacing strategy. It is a case of um, reaching your maximum performance potential on the day, so maximizing what you know you can achieve on the day. Okay. Um, but it's no good chasing a time and having a strategy if it's then 30 degrees and you're expected it to be 15, 17 degrees and you're not used to the heat. So, yeah. so it's individual, event, circumstances, whatever, all these things kind of build into it, I guess. Well, yeah, and I think for, for certainly for novices as well, and, and obviously the more experienced you get, this, is, this becomes less of an issue, but I'll come back to the word sort of honesty again with yourself about, a, a, I think sometimes people might get too caught up in all the small stuff about running, you know, in terms of the physiology and the monitoring and all, all that, whereas there are some quite basic probably principles that you might adopt. And in terms of pacing, it may simply be to be honest about what you've been doing in training pace-wise, not to hold yourself back, but to understand what level you might start the event at and then take it from there rather than getting caught up in the crowd um, and the event and then ultimately falling flat because you you sort of didn't give yourself enough chance at the beginning and you maybe went out a bit hard so that's certainly a common thing you'll find in mass events anyway that people go out too fast because you get carried along with the crowd and then ultimately dig yourself a hole and, and it's not then nice to come back from so yeah and that's hard and it's really hard to sort of just dial into your own pace when you've got all these other paces going mm. on around you and at a start, mm. start of a race so it's something again I think that probably comes with experience mm. yeah and, and also I think an important thing and Trish is by far and away more of a, an expert in this than me but it also comes down to your goals as well in the sense of some people will be doing events to enjoy them and to just take part in them and, and therefore might a conservative pace might might be perfectly fine for that because you're more than likely going to enjoy it whereas yep. if you are entering an event wanting to you know maximize your pace um, and your, your time and, and achieve that then as Shane alluded to earlier on you know you, you're going to be more than willing to accept some risk in your decisions and, and therefore the consequences that might come with that in terms of discomfort and not enjoying it and so on so it does also boil down to what you want from a race as well yeah which I think is important so um, I'm just going to jump in with Rob's question. Um, you, you know, you speak about uh, crowds and stuff. And so Rob said, I have found my best runs are when there are bigger crowds and more runners around me. What do you suggest for races that aren't so popular, but still run well? I missed that last bit, Shane. Sorry, say that last um, bit. So Rob says, I found my best runs when there are bigger crowds and more runners around me. What do you suggest for races? that aren't so popular um so i guess maybe a, a london marathon compared to a run out in the fens well there's a couple of factors and, and again trish might want to come in at some point but you've obviously got social facilitation playing a part there you know in the sense of the crowd and, and being amongst others and, and how that motivates you more uh, as well as the event mattering um compared to training you've also got quite you as, as runners in crowded events or in, in events where there's packs, there's, a, there's quite a big drafting effect as well that you can obviously get a benefit from. So there's elements there that will undoubtedly affect the pace when you look at your watch or your time and think that was, that was quick. Um, I guess, therefore, the logical advice and, and the evidence would suggest that when you're solo, when you're doing a time trial, that you need to be mindful of that um, in the sense of not expecting to produce the same pace. Um, especially well you mentioned the fence probably as an example but especially if the terrain's different um, but there is certainly a factor there of, of uh, aerodynamic benefit for sure and, and I think that that yeah it shouldn't be underestimated both ways when you're on your own uh, and expecting to run the same as you do in a pack then that's probably not feasible um, but likewise when you're training on your own and then you go into a race don't be surprised if there is a little bit of carry along with the crowd and then you're surprised by your pace and um, this is what we're talking about about being sensitive to your your um, physical sensations as well you know and, and being able to judge how you feel because uh, if your pace is looking fast and it's worrying you that you, oh am I going too hard here then, it, then it's also a case of, of listening to your body as well and thinking rationally through those factors that might be helping you out as well uh, but yeah so I've, in a nutshell to cut it down to some a, a sentence yeah expect to go slower when you're on your own there you go <laughs> yeah. and i think what you're saying that is um are the sort of strategies i guess that you can dial into if you were in a race that wasn't so popular so if there was a race where you're out 
I don't know, they do a marathon in Mablethorpe, don't they? Which I, I imagine. Oh, I've done that one. Done it, so have you done that one? Yeah. I imagine it's quieter than London <laughs> in terms of runners and crowds. So how how can you sort of adapt to to running like that? I guess to racing like that. Mm. I guess from psychology, yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah. It's, I suppose a couple of things there. Number one, planning for it, so you, so you know what to expect coming into the race. It's it's not going to be your your typical London marathon. I think one of the elements of the crowd as well can often be a, the social support element mightn't be quite there. I was thinking about what other strategies um, that could be useful for you. So, for example. Is it the case that the crowd gives you confidence? Um, I'm just thinking from the psychological perspective, but you know, does that does that support make you feel good about yourself? So what what alternatives might you have? Uh, and I guess it's looking at other strategies that you might employ. So whether that's kind of some some chunking strategy. So if you're on a stretch of road and, and there's not too many people around you for a certain period of time. And, you know, it's quite a while. You can see a good long stretch. So how are you going to break that down? So you might try to, you know, get to the next lamppost, get to the next section, whatever it may be. And I suppose it's using kind of different strategies and preparing, be, being prepared to use those strategies. They're just not going to, you know, fall out, of, fall out of the air and you're going to be able to use them or you're going to come up with them on the day. So I guess it's anticipating that you're going to be in those kind of solo scenarios preparing for that and, and seeing what strategies you can actually use and develop in advance, learn about, and then ultimately use them when it comes to the performance. So be that, you know, focusing on um, using kind of self-talk strategies, finding what works for you in that regard can be, can be really valuable. So the planning part is key. And I think going back to that point that, that Danny mentioned in relation to the goals just before we had this question, I think that that's really valuable is actually being quite rational about your goals. So sometimes we talk about having kind of a gold, a silver and a bronze. So your gold is like the best possible day. You know, there's no breeze. It's a lovely temperature. This is the ideal time for running. And that's maybe when you want to hit a PB. You know, your silver is a little bit back from that. Um, and then your bronze is probably, you know, bottom bottom level that this is what I will I will need to, to get around whatever it may be what's the lowest goal that I would I would accept um, so I guess it's being realistic and um, managing each situation accepting that each race or performance you go into is going to be different and the more equipped more prepared you can actually be for that and um, the better you'll be able to manage that when it comes to the race scenario mm. yeah. Yeah, that's really good that's good um, I'm not sure where we're up to, Anna. I've, uh, <laughs> I know, we've been all over the place. Been first. Don't we? Um, well, I, I guess we can talk, it seems we've talking about, been talking about pacing a little bit, go on to the implications of pacing with or without a watch. Um, and I know, again, that's probably another, uh, another sort of factor that can be divisive and whether we're using a, a watch to manage our pace or running off our, running by feel and by effort. And, and I guess what are the, what the psychological implications of using a watch um yeah go with it what do you think what's what, what your uh, what's the research saying on, on using a watch to to gauge our pace in terms of the general pacing literature and there's been a recent review just come out uh, i think wearable tech is seen as a positive thing um in terms of performance and pacing because it gives you more objective information so it's not a problem in itself i think the view is that um, there's a danger of athletes becoming reliant on it um, one way or another, um, whether that's that they've got heart rate um, coming through on their watch and, and they're sort of um, relying too heavily on one piece of information like heart rate or speed uh, and not appreciating, like we've said already, you know, that internal conversation of how you're feeling and, and how the race is going and how the course pans out the wind the weather whatever it might be um, so i think you know broadly speaking they're good and and i think people if they've got access to that information should learn how to use them but in as part of a recipe as part of a mixture of internal sensations external information as as in the race conditions and the race environment and then this objective information that they've got and i think if people can start to think of that triangle then you're probably onto a onto a relatively good thing uh, it's when it sort of gets 
gets to be the in thing at this point in time and people just rigidly stick to it that they might lose sight of the other things and i think that's when when you might get a problem especially in longer events as well when you have other factors then that come into play you know when you're starting to look at your heart rate that is actually drifting a lot because of the temperature or dehydration or whatever it might be um so so yeah i think i think they're a good thing um but i think as part of a package or a toolkit however you want to call it um, and people shouldn't necessarily be afraid to ditch them in training now and again as well um, to get used to how it feels without it yeah yeah it makes really good sense as well and i think also being aware of something I'm trying to practice at the moment is how I feel at particular paces. So that if I was to go without a watch, what would it, what would it feel like um, at those different paces? And it's a good, good thing to practice. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the danger, one thing it's useful for, to come back to the previous question, I suppose, which is a useful analogy, is that whole, you know, other athletes in a, in a race that you're not familiar with, it's a bit less popular, but at a lower level, if you don't use that information, um, then you run the risk of using other people. And then they, how do you know they're any better or worse at pacing than you? The, the likelihood is that they're as good, if not worse. Um, and then you're sort of relying on them and people get suckered along on, on, on that journey. Um, so I think they may also serve as a bit of a checkpoint, um, which is useful, but, but certainly to dip in and out of, not to you know, rigidly focus on. They might hold you back as well, and we've seen that before as well. So certainly from halfway three quarters of the way onwards you start to move, maybe move more and more towards your own intuition your own feelings but they're certainly helping that in that early period um, when you're not getting that immediate feedback from your you know from your body yeah. on how this intensity or how the race is feeling because because with the best will in the world you, you're probably not going to do that at the start of anything you know upwards of 10k and um, you're probably not going to know if the first quarter is too hard or or not um, and yeah. so there's certainly a useful gauge to get you started as well yeah. I think um, you know sometimes certainly my experience using a watch um, I think uh, my, old, my old coach Mark very quickly realised when I was track racing to take my watch off because you know over short races at high intensity I'm just you know constantly looking at that and it sometimes that doesn't necessarily matter if, if, you're, if you've trained at certain intensities but I think I like what you said about you know having, having that triangle you know being able to use everything um, I, th I think helps because, yeah, w would it be wise to do your first marathon blind? Maybe not, but maybe if you're somebody who does all, all your training on your own, you don't need to rely on your watch. Um, perhaps, yeah, um, maybe wear it, don't look at it. I'm always trying to encourage clients to, certainly on these ones you talk about slowing down, Anna. I mean, when I'm first getting a client to slow, to try and slow down to see if it's a good strategy to use in terms of polarizing training, um, sometimes they have to look at their watch and their heart rate to keep themselves slow. Once you're used to it, turn it around, don't wear it. You know, if it's nice outside, get in the woods, look at some trees, and then, you know, maybe go into, you know, you know you, you're going into the, one of these psychological experiences. It can, I find it can be quite mentally relaxing, especially if, you know, you want to hit your marathon PB and your long run every week is your, your intense session. It's like, well, you utilize your other training days to switch off from the tech um as long as you know you're doing your correct sort of training zone switch off from the tech and experience some of these other psychological states um i mean that's that's purely my interpretation of it but um i think yeah the the, the triangle experience and everything is um i guess it, it makes your running journey a bit more whole as well rather than just yeah focusing on one one element um, even the best in the world do that so it's a theory yeah I think I think what you're describing sort of and it's my view as well is almost um, a literacy uh, so have being literate in and picking up the vocabulary so to speak of those different things um, and once you become like you said familiar to it there's a, a well-established learning effect of things like pacing and being able to pace yourself experience is is fundamental to that so information along the way will help build that experience and, and yeah i think i think it's important for people you know as they as they're trying to improve to to think about it as picking up literacy in those things uh, whether that's like you said that the internal sort of sensations and, and enjoyment at certain and being able to pitch a pace at a certain level also how it feels to go 
you know hard and what that heart rate was and, and what that pace was so yeah i think i think it's a really important thing mm. and then and also just to simplify it a little bit like we've got to remember sometimes our, our devices we use phones watches um they're not 100 percent accurate um so if you, if you can learn teach your body to be able to sort of get in the right zone sometimes that could be a more accurate measure of a physiological threshold that you need to run at um but obviously it takes practice and and, uh, and consciousness and yeah literacy um Trish, Actually, I'll... a question I'll... just come in on that as well if you, if you don't mind me just throwing this in just uh james has just come up with a question which ties in really nicely with all that the, the pacing um, and he's, he asks that, that when running short runs at threshold, so he's talking about five kilometer distance, he convinces himself to slow down halfway through to be able to manage the later stages of the run. But then he ends up sprinting the last 200 meters and kicking himself that he slowed earlier. So how much is that an appropriate pacing strategy or should he be looking more into central governor theory, which I know we touched on earlier? So, and then he said, it's a broad question, but he's interested to know your thoughts. So it's going, it's going out too hard and then slowing down and then speed. I mean, the, the end sprint is, um, well, it's termed a few things. And I don't know who came up with it. Well, end spurt is the, is the common one. But end sprint, I prefer because it sounds a bit better, um, is classic. You know, I, I don't think you should be necessarily kicking yourself for being able to sprint at the end because that's, that's a very, very, very common trait of any self-paced performance. I think the thing to maybe try and focus on rather than that there is an end sprint is, the extent of that so whether that is you know a f five kilometer an hour increased or you know or, or more um and the deviation sort of the, the amount of deviation in the middle of the race you know how much is he dropping off um you know a positive pace you know going hard at the start of a race so a positive pacing strategy at 5k level um is not necessarily detrimental to performance but if you're having to slow significantly down in the middle then there's obviously um, something to fine tune with 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 the pacing there um, but again you know that that sort of distance is just on the borderline of being able to judge that first segment um, well enough to not put yourself in a, in a hole it's quite a fine tightrope um, certainly some of the research I've done in the past has found that if we make people go um, three percent harder than than a baseline performance in a 5k this is during a triathlon but still in a, in a 5k um, that they can pick up that they'll pick up on that even if we deceive them um, so there there isn't a lot of tolerance at that sort of distance for deviations in pace around what is your actual real maximum average um, so I suppose I suppose for that I can't remember what you said the name was James 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 so I suppose for James it is going back to that point about um, maybe thinking about honestly breaking down the paces and, and looking in training what might help him work out a, a sort of appropriate 5k pace to start the first third at or first quarter at to then build on rather than feeling like uh, you've got to substantially slow down but certainly not not to try and avoid this end sprint it wants to be obviously as little as you've got left to give at the end and not having slowed down but there will always more than likely be a, uh, the capacity to do that at the end yeah mm. and and james go into those uh open-minded as in you know if you've got a, a set a, a, you've set a pace except that you might fail at it except that you might not get that sprint at the end um just practice it see how it feels I think that's really important, Shane, as well. And I, I spoke about this a lot to some colleagues um, uh, within all this pacing debate and training and so on. And I think it's really, really important for people to understand uh, their limit as well. Uh, and training is obviously great for that, you know, and to accept some time. Even racing, you know, I've entered races before and ultimately gone, you know what, this, this is a secondary race. I'll just absolutely hammer myself, you know. Uh, but this comes back to the idea of goals and what we're doing sessions and races for. But I do think people understanding their limit and what it feels right to sort of crack or fail is, is really important part of that learning process i think it's invaluable yeah, yeah and i think to come in on that as well if if, if we go back to the so as the previous point was around you know using the watch to pace and also you know how that that learning about our bodily sensations and learning about effort and feel and so on i think one of the the 
the net the drawback sometimes of using a watch is that some days you know you're not hitting a pace and and some people can be quite critical of themselves and in that sense if, if they're not hitting that pace on a given day but it could be the case they've just come off the back of a heavy week of training uh, you know there could be a multitude of stressors beyond the running context that could actually be impacting on on that as well so i think it's kind of taking it there and then on that day um, and also accepting kind of this might be your best in that scenario and learning what that that is and and learning about the, those bodily sensations can be really helpful in that as well i think that's a key point trish that word learning um you know a session like that or a race like that is not a problem in itself i don't think anyone should i should think people should maybe reflect and turn it into a positive and what what have they learned about how it felt you know what were the the feelings they had before that slowdown as well and and what pace were they running at and so on and, and to see it in context like trish says i think that's a really valuable point about learning rather than um sort of putting it to the side and putting it down as a bad day and, and sort of carrying on regardless so uh, which which i know we can all do when we when we don't quite hit our hit our target sometimes yeah and that actually that that well, if you've pretty much answered it actually, but I, the final question that I was going to bring up was the effect of optimal performance on psychological well-being. So what I'm thinking about really is how does training and racing well affect our day-to-day -day lives compared with perceived poor performance or not training due to injury or something like that and how we feel then. So yeah, I guess it's how, how we learn from when something's not gone so well um, and but then how does that feed into how we um, feel day to day yeah and I think you know if we look at a lot of a lot of research again looking at some elite endurance runners and and they speak about actually going through a conscious process of reviewing and evaluating after after running and um, so actually looking back on the run you know what strategies might they have used during the performance what what worked what maybe didn't work as effectively at a, at a certain time and and essentially it's building up um almost like a profile over time and building up a bank of knowledge that you start to become more aware of you know what strategies to use at certain times or whatever it may be but i suppose that from the perspective of of running and, and and exercising you know engaging in the activity can have a really positive impact on us from a from a mental health perspective in terms of you know, it, it makes us feel good, it makes us feel better once we've engaged in the activity. But I suppose sometimes it can, ha you know, some individuals, if they do have a, have a performance that isn't as good, it can have a, somewhat of a negative impact, especially if they identify themselves as, you know, having quite, let's say, what we call an athletic identity. So from that perspective, it's really important to, to try and be rational after performances um, when things maybe don't go so well and looking upon them as, as learning opportunities. And I think that's probably a really important thing as well is to avoid having scenarios where we only identify ourselves as athletes. Um, and I suppose that's a, probably a whole other, whole other point that we probably can't get into too much here. But I think the big thing is, is just recognizing that, you know, if, if things don't go so well, what, what can you learn from it? What can you take from it and, and move forward with it too? Yeah, really good, really good strategy, really, for, like you say, moving forward from it and moving on. Excellent. Have you got any other questions you wanted to ask, Shane? Um, I don't think I've got any questions, no. Um, I think, yeah, we're, we're at the we're at nine o'clock, so we're, time's almost up. So um, I guess if there's anything you two want to add about what we spoke to that, that you feel like you should have said, um, if not, do you both have sort of three pearls of, of wisdom you can sort of share three might be too many maybe one pearl of wisdom that you think people could but you'd really encourage people to take away and, and and try in their own you know their own winning journey if not don't worry <laughs> and, and also actually um if trish wanted to just introduce your research a little bit because i know you've got a research project going on at the moment um i know you've sent me a photo and i've tried to post it and i can't but after as soon as we we go off uh, line i'll post the the little uh, poster about it as well but i don't know if you wanted to say something about it before we sign off yeah um so yeah at the minute I, i'm doing a, a study i'm looking at um optimal experiences in in sport and exercise so i'm really keen to 
to recruit some runners. So um, Anna will post the details if, if, if you'd be interested in taking part. Um, it's essentially looking at all the good um, elements of when we're, when we're out there, when we're running, also other endurance activities. So yeah, just feel free to, to drop me an email. It's bjackman at lincoln.ac.uk. I'll give you some, some more details at the point. In terms of some advice, um, I suppose as someone um, who's taken up running in the last few months um, with, with Anna's great guidance, um, Okay. I'm, I'm probably trying to learn, so I've learned a huge amount from this evening's chat as well, which, which has been great. Uh, but for me, it's, it's just enjoy it uh, and whatever it is that, that you enjoy. So we're all in it for, for different reasons. But for a lot of people, we get a lot of pleasure from, from engaging and running. So um, yeah, that would, that would be my, my top of voice would be to, to enjoy it and, and to do what makes you feel good. I like that. Supposed to come in there. I'm not sure if it's a pearl of wisdom, but it's pretty... <laughs> I'm sure most people have, have been advised this at some point, but pacing wise, number one, run your own race for a start. If you certainly if you're in a, an event with other people, so run your own race. Um, there is no perfect pacing strategy, um, but keep it simple. So I think in training, in terms of pacing, in training and pacing and racing, keep it simple, but try to build up your experience of paces and pacing and whether that's in events and doing mock events or experiencing um those different you know types of training intensity i think building up your uh, your literacy in, in your internal sensation understanding and external environment understanding is, is key um but i mean from from a general perspective of, of testing people in the human performance center and, and research one thing we do commonly come across is people worrying about the five percent and not the 95 percent of what matters to pacing and, and to performance so you know rather than worry about all these finer points maybe just take a broader view of your training about you know how much you're doing what just generally you know the, the mileage you might be doing or the type of training you might be doing but also when you're thinking about a race you know just generally do you know what the course is you know have you practiced that full distance yet um, and do you know just generally what your goal is and and how you're going to basically try and start out on the race with that goal in mind but not to overthink you know all those little minor things those those novel things that are hitting the headlines yeah good, good, good wisdom definitely yeah. from both of you um so i guess you know just to finish with um where obviously you've mentioned about your study trish will uh once we finish recording our, we can pop the picture in the comments but um is there anywhere where anyone watching can sort of follow what you two do or find any more information like twitter or anything like that yeah so um i'm at trish underscore jackman on twitter so you'll find me there and yeah, generally staff profile at the University of Lincoln is also a bit of an insight into to some research and research papers and, and always feel free to get in touch. My email address will be there if, if anyone wants to get in touch and, and get a copy of, of some of the papers and so on, more than willing to, to share and to, um, to give away as well some, some of the knowledge that we've been able to acquire through, through our research. I'll post the links to those contacts in uh, the comments as well. And Danny, are you on Twitter as well? Yeah, I'm um, uh, imaginatively at Dr. Danny Taylor. Um, so yeah, by all means, get in touch there. We're, we're more general. Obviously, the current situation uh, is maybe going to hinder the next twelve months somewhat in terms of uh, some of the research we, we might want to do. But there's always generally um, a need for us or a want for us to to get local athletes involved whether that's in student practice for physiology testing um, or whether that's our own research so certainly um, if anyone's interested in generally being on some sort of mailing list or is just generally keen then then i've i've got that in my email inbox so we'd be keen to just keep young keep people in the loop or on file and and when the time comes we'll uh, we can get people in touch and get them in brilliant thank you stuff so um so wrap up there thanks everyone for, for watching um again i'm, I'm shane from Axe veg sports therapy so you can you can search me on facebook instagram i'm not as active on twitter as these two um if you want to find more information about me um anna yeah and exactly the same i'm on facebook and instagram and again not as active on twitter um but yeah feel free to look me up um 
And Anna's Lindum exercise therapy. Exercise therapy, yes. Um, so, yeah, um, we'll have another one lined up for you in two weeks. So uh, we'll post information on that close to the time. Um, but thanks for watching. If you know anyone who wants to uh, re-watch it, you can re-watch it on the Facebook group and we will get the recording up on YouTube. Um, good night. Thank you. Right. Let's finish this line.